Should we have a sort of moment of silence, maybe, for the fallen? Nah, yeah, that's good. Let's get on with it. Well, I was really hoping it would make it to at least an entire year, but here we are. So I'm not gonna be talking a whole lot about the pros of the Sigma FP because I'm pretty sure I've covered that enough here on this channel. However, if you are new here, I've left a link to a massive playlist down in the description below to get you caught up. What I am going to be focusing on is the downsides of the FP that I've come to discover throughout these past nine months of using it on a daily basis, and they really started to annoy me. And you know, it's really only four things, but to me, they hold a lot of weight. But the good news is, since these cons for me are primarily on the photo side, for most of you, these things may not even be an issue. Because as I've demonstrated here on the channel, I'm pretty sure we're all aware now that the FP has some amazing cinema capabilities. However, that was not in fact how I was using the camera on a daily basis. For me, the Sigma FP was my everyday carry camera. I think what a lot of people forget is that this camera right here, the Red Komodo, was my main breadwinner and still is. I think a lot of people got it twisted and thought that I was trying to replace my Komodo with the FP or something crazy like that and that's just not the case. I just thought that the FP was an awesome entry level cinema camera, I still think that. And so I presented all of that information to you because look, I know who my general audience is. So with that being said, I thought, hey, let me present this a little tiny cinema camera to them. It was a decent price, well it was back then. Come on Sigma, how are you gonna jack it up to $1,900 now? Look, you can blame it on COVID. Whatever, the price has gone up, right? Uh, beyond that, even at the price it's at now, it still is an awesome entry-level cinema camera. And we've done plenty of tests on it here. That was the whole point of me doing all these videos on it over the past nine months, because I wanted to give that option to you guys. I would choose it over any of the Blackmagic Pocket cinema cameras. So, and I still stand true to that. However, when it came to me and how I was actually using the FP, well, I was primarily using it for photography. And I know you might be going, well, wait, I thought the FPL was the better choice for photography. Remember, I did compare both of those cameras already in the past. So the issues I have with the FP still applies to the FPL. And some of these drawbacks that I find in these cameras do actually leak into the video side, especially depending on whatever your specific needs or desires are. Because here's the reality of it. Whatever I need in a camera is not going to be exactly what you need in a camera. I've always looked at cameras as tools. And what I expect out of these tools is to have the features that I need to make my life easier. We learned a lot about the camera, there's no denying that. Despite all of its uniqueness on the cinema side, however, it still was not unique in the ways that I intended to use it, which was actually for photography and everyday carry. So let's go through these cons now, and do keep in mind that these apply to both the FP and the FPL. Highlights. Now, unfortunately, this affects both the video and the stills. While I'm talking, take notice of all of these crazy blown out highlights and all of these samples. The camera just cannot capture highlights to save its life, even when it's shooting in RAW. I've showed on here how you cannot push that camera beyond one stop over without it becoming unacceptable. However, this was not a complete deal breaker for me, as you all know. My workaround was to just always underexpose. Now, obviously to do that, you have to shoot in RAW, but the disadvantage is, is you're always monitoring a really underexposed image. Now, for those of you using it on little music videos or whatever little jobs you're using the Sigma FP on, you know, and you have a client or someone looking at the monitor, good luck convincing them that the actual image isn't going to be that underexposed. Auto focus. Now, this was something that I've always cared less about. I primarily shoot with vintage manual lenses anyways. However, since using the A7S III as of last fall, uh, autofocus has really taken a hold on me. And for any of you thinking that autofocus is a feature of the FP or the FPL that you're going to be able to lean on, trust me when I tell you the technology inside of the Sigma cameras feels years behind, especially when compared to a Sony. Even the native contemporary Sigma L mount lenses are bad performers in my opinion. And I don't care if you're shooting in video or stills, it's not very good performance. It's way worse in video, it's a little better in stills, but still, it's not something I would rely on, and it's not something I ever did rely on. The only time I was even remotely impressed with the autofocus of the Sigma FP was with the little 
pancake Leica TL 18 millimeter lens. Other than that, I treated that camera the same way I do with my Komodo. I just say, hey, look, the autofocus is unreliable. There is no way I would ever depend on it. Again, not a complete deal breaker if you're used to shooting cinema and pulling focus manually. However, I know a lot of folks depend and rely on autofocus, so I just thought I should definitely include it. Necessary add-on. The screen on these cameras are pretty useless for monitoring, in my opinion. They're just not bright enough for most outdoor conditions and they are fixed screens. I mean, that is why I immediately bought the add-on EVF. And it's honestly the only way I ever used that camera. I mean, it instantly made it a million times more enjoyable to use. However, as good as that EVF is, you pay for it dearly. It's a $700 add-on for a proprietary piece of kit. And as cool as it is, it's like half the size of the camera. So you're immediately compromising the compactness and portability of the FP. The clencher. So here comes the biggest flaw of these cameras for me. The absence of a mechanical shutter. I cannot tell you how many images that I took at night or indoors that were ruined because of the electronic shutter. Because I take photos in a more traditional way, I tend to either shoot in all manual mode or aperture priority mode. I don't use the little LCD screen at all, I only use the EVF, and I don't preview the images that I take. But when you use the FP or the FPL at nighttime or indoors with traditional practical lighting, the flickering and banding will cost you. And I really wish I had more samples to share with you, but I just did not have the foresight to save a bunch of crappy images. All right, we have to just pause here because I've been editing this video and I've been going through all of these drives and I have not been able to find examples of this banding issue because I deleted all of the photos over the past nine months because why would I hold on to crappy images? But I kept digging, kept digging, and eventually I found these goofy photos of my nephews that I took of them standing next to this cardboard cutout of, I believe it's Paula Dean. so I apologize because uh, we are not fans of Paula Dean. it was just supposed to be a funny photo. But <laughs> the whole reason I wanted to say this is so this could make sense. If you just look at these photos on their own, you can't really, you would never notice it, right? But the reality is it is there. And if you were there in person and saw what that spot of that indoor location, it's just a restaurant, you would see what that area actually look like. I'm gonna play these in sequence because I tend to shoot in continuous mode, right? Then you can totally see the banding because you can watch as the shadows, the lines, they change position. You'll, you'll totally be able to see it as soon as these start playing in sequence. I would get home, load the images into Lightroom, and instantly be bummed out because most of my images were ruined because of the banding. So then, in order to adopt to this, your workflow gets really slowed down, which means I would then have to preview every single picture I took, check for banding. If it was there, I'd have to frantically start searching for a different shutter speed that wouldn't cause flicker. Now, the Sigma website claims that if you shoot in aperture priority mode, the FP is supposedly designed to detect flickering automatically. However, that was never the case for me. But also, if you shoot in continuous mode, it hinders this auto detect anyways. But honestly, guys, it wouldn't matter if I was in single mode or continuous mode. If it was nighttime or there was any sort of non-film lights around, it would always flicker. That's a huge deal breaker if you're a documentary or street shooter. Another reason why that auto detect may not be so great is because of the somewhat slow readout speed of the actual sensor. The FP sensor readout was measured at 20.8 milliseconds. This was like a test I think Cine D did. So if you compare that to the Sony a7S III, which has a readout speed of 8.7 milliseconds, that means the Sigma has a 58% slower readout speed. So now keeping that in mind, now consider the maximum flash sync speed of these cameras, which in my opinion is very poor. The FP maxes out at 1 30th of a second. Meanwhile, the FPL maxes out at 1 15th of a second. And it's even worse if you're shooting in RAW for the FPL, 14-bit uh, RAW, caps it at one tenth of a second. So supposedly the FPL is supposed to be the better choice for stills, right? Because of its whopping 61 megapixels. Well then why is the maximum flash sync speed so low? It's insanely low compared to today's common standards. These are just clear signs to me that these Sigma 
Panasonic cameras are not actually designed for photography. And I just primarily say that because the flickering and banding is really atrocious. And because of that, I can no longer trust the FP for how I was intending to use it. Now, the flip side to this is that it never really seemed to be an issue on the cinema side. And I don't know if that's because of different frequencies or shutter angle versus shutter speed, or maybe I just didn't notice it and it was happening, or perhaps I just chose to not notice it, you know, like a mom in denial. <laughs> Either way, when it came to stills, there was absolutely no way to deny that it was there. So in the end, that little Sigma FP ended up being the camera that sat on the shelf. And it was supposed to be my everyday carry. However, after nine months, it became my never day carry. Now, something like the A7S III, which I'm filming this talking head with right now, it has both a mechanical and electronic shutter. And a lot of the newer Leica cameras have this as well. But a bonus of the Sony cameras is they have an anti-flicker feature. Now, for me, being a nighttime shooter, this anti-flicker mode is an amazing feature to have. But regardless of any of this, none of this is an issue if you just have a camera with a real shutter. Not to mention, it just feels better when you take the picture. With a mechanical shutter, you know, if I have my Sony a7S III set to the mechanical shutter, you can literally feel it when you take the picture. With all of my analog film cameras, you can feel when you take the picture. That's kind of a nice thing to have. <laughs> because with the FP, half the time, I wouldn't even know if I took the picture or not because you can't feel the picture being taken, right? I guess what I'm trying to say is, it ain't got no soul. Not to mention the a7S III's maximum flash sync speed is one over 250, which is actually a more typical maximum sync speed by today's standards. But then again, the a7S III is supposed to be primarily a video camera, right? And yet somehow it's smoking out both the FP and the FPL in these regards. But again, a lot of you may not find these issues deal breakers for how you need to use these Sigma cameras. For me, I tolerated it as long as I could, and I guess nine months was the limit. So yeah, ultimately in the end, I did end up selling my Sigma FP kit back in December. And honestly, I thought it was a camera that I would never get rid of. It was supposed to be my personal everyday carry and not something that I was ever trying to make money off of. You know, again, even when I was selling it, he people here in LA were like, I thought you loved that camera. And I'm like, yeah, I do. It's a great camera for cinema, but not for how I intend to use it. And I think people forget like, I am a red Komodo owner. That will always be the camera I take onto jobs. That is the camera that my commercial and corporate clients are expecting me to bring onto those jobs. I would not expect those clients to even know what the hell a Sigma FP is, quite honestly. Again, I was more excited for the people that needed an entry-level cinema camera. Am I to be bashed for that? For helping out the filmmaking community? Okay. The reality is as much as I enjoyed the cinema side of the camera, in the long run, that's not why I originally bought it for me. You know, I just wanted an ultra compact camera for stills. And that was the FP, it was full frame, it's weatherproof. It's very compact, I mean, until you put the must-have EVF on it, but still, it seemed to be the kind of awesome option. For me, the cinema side was all bonus, and again, I could share it with all of you, but the more I used it the way that I was intending to use it, nah, well, there you go. Here's the upside to this. We got to really dive into that camera and discover a lot of things about it. We had a lot of fun with it here on the channel. There's no denying it. And you know, even in my day to day, I had a lot of fun with that camera. I took it all over America. So yeah, it wasn't a complete loss, but as all good things go, they must come to an end. Look, here's the reality of it. I'm not in love with the tools. I'm in love with the final product. My passion is image making, period, end of story. And once the tools compromise the end result, well, hey man, they gotta go. With all of that being said, I want you to focus on the tool that you need to create the images that you wanna create. What you need and what I need is not what anyone else needs. Use the tool that makes sense for you. If you love the Sigma FP and it's performing the way that you need it to perform, well then keep using it. I cannot stress it enough. I still think it is the number one entry level cinema camera even of today's date of February, 2023. If I would have had access to the Sigma FP six years ago when I was first starting out with the little baby black magic pocket cinema camera, the original with the little super 16 sensor, I would have been through the roof to have a camera like the Sigma FP. Even nowadays, I think that still applies. I would always choose it over a pocket 6K or even the pocket 6K Pro. The benefits of full frame are insane. Better low light performance, less noise, and a greater depth of field. 
Not to mention the amazing color science and oh, let's not forget 4K 12-bit uncompressed RAW, right? Let's be real here, it's still an awesome entry-level cinema camera. However, I don't think the FP or the FPL are good options for photography. But more importantly, please remember, these cameras, these tools are not extensions of ourselves, which means they are all disposable. Okay, let's be real here. Unless they say Leica or Aerie on the side, none of them have a very long shelf life. As long as the world continues to evolve and not even the evolution of our society can keep up with the evolution of technology, all of these cameras are literally degrading as I speak. The only things that matter to me is its usability and the way that the tool allows me to perform. So yeah, I've been forced to be using my Sony a7S III for all of my photography and street photography. I know some of you are like, oh wow, forced? It's almost a $4,000 camera. But again, you know, I bought the Sony. You guys know why I bought the Sony. If you don't, I'll leave a link to reasons why I bought the Sony down below. It is definitely not meant to be my everyday carry. It's really just a stand-in. It's the fill-in for now while I'm experimenting with a couple other everyday carry cameras. But as you guys know, I like to use things for at least a month before I share my experiences with them here on the channel. However, in the meantime, I will be doing another video on what I think is the most slept on feature of the Sony a7S III. And it doesn't matter if you use it for video or stills. So if you're new here and you liked what you heard or saw, please tap that subscribe button. If you're already subscribed, do me a favor and make sure that the notification bell is turned on because that's the only way to preserve my presence. Guys like me with a very small following, we get buried in the algorithm. So a good way to help me out on that, if you're a super huge fan, let's do something cool. Take a screen grab of anywhere in this video of your liking, share it over there on your Instagram stories, be sure to tag me and I'll be sure to reshare it and we can help each other out. And for all of my ultra diehard fans, if you want a more personal and immersive experience, then I highly recommend you check out the Dog Times Patreon, which is a really cool private indie filmmaking making virtual clubhouse. I put out members only weekly videos and we have our own private discord. And I gotta give a shout out to this month's Patreon producer, David Carroll. And look, if I bummed any of you out because you're a new FP owner or you were like me hoping that you could use it for cinema and photos, just remember, my experience should not influence your experience. You have the tool in your hand, you find out for yourself if it's gonna deliver the way that you need it to deliver. And feel free to use any of the videos that I put out on these cameras over the past nine months as a great reference. For now, that is a wrap. Hello, my 26,000 friends. Today may be a sad day for some of you, but just remember, you subscribe to me and not to the tools that I use. Or at least that's the lie I tend to tell myself. Either way, just know, Sigma will never make you feel the way that I do. I gotta admit, it was a fun camera. Until it wasn't.